Well, folks, everything in America has now become racist. All the things, because here's the thing, Americans aren't racist. So all the people who hate the system, they have to come up with some excuse for why they hate the system. So they're just looking for new excuses. We have a real problem in the United States. We have a serious shortage. The supply lines are broken on racism. There's just apparently not enough for it for the media. There just isn't enough of it. And, and the demand has now dramatically exceeded the supply. See, here's the thing about the United States. The people of the United States are not particularly racist by every available poll. The American people are not racist. They don't mind having people of different races living near them. They don't mind interracial marriage. None of these things bother the American people in any significant numbers. And that's true across the nation. There are not significant regional differences between, say, the South and the North. That is a self-flattering picture painted by the New York Times about its own constituents. But the reality, again, is that Americans, broad, broadly written, are not a racist people. In fact, we are some of the least racist people on Earth. But in order for systemic change to be effectuated by the left in the United States, there must always be a marginalized population to be used as a cudgel against the system. Because if the system basically allows people to succeed or fail on their own merits, if the system rewards hard work, for example, and punishes people for not doing hard work, or rewards responsible decision-making and punishes people for non-responsible decision-making, well, then disparities may arise. And those disparities may not land equally on every group because, as it turns out, every group is made up of disparate individuals. And it's possible that a, a disparate number of individuals who act irresponsibly is located within one group versus another group. But if the end goal is equity, all groups must achieve equal outcome, well, then you have to have something to say about the system beyond it's just not fair. You have to have a reason why it's not fair. And so we must have continual supply, a fire hose of stories about how America is deeply racist and deeply terrible. Now, again, the problem is that it's hard to come up with those stories because those stories actually don't exist broad writ. It's hard to find them. In fact, the most popular stories about systemic American racism typically are false. Stories about, for example, the idea that the police across the nation are seeking the lives of black people, are seeking to murder black people in the streets. And they'll, pin, they'll take that story, which is not true, and they will pin it to another story, like, say, the death of George Floyd, and suggest that that is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of systemic racism without ever actually making the accusation that George Floyd's death had anything to do with race per se, as opposed to a bad action by a police officer at best. But again, we have to have, this is why the, the Jussie Smillier story became immediate fodder for the entire left. Because again, when there is high demand for racist incidents, the supply must be filled. And even if you have to generate airsats supply, you will do so. You can't come up with the real thing. You got to make something. And this is how you come up with an article in CNN today over at CNN.com written by a person named John Blake. And it is called, What's Digital Blackface? And why is it wrong when white people use it? Well, you might be asking yourself, what is, he what is digital blackface? Now, typically, blackface speaks of people back in the 19th and 20th centuries, early 20th centuries, who would dress up as black people in the most mocking of ways in order to be pejorative about black people. It's the Amos and, and Andy step and fetch it kind of stuff, right? Ugly, hideous stuff that is designed in order to mock black people. So what exactly are we talking about when we say digital blackface? Well, here is what John Blake says. Maybe you shared that viral video of Kimberly Sweet Brown Wilkins telling a reporter after narrowly escaping an apartment fire, ain't nobody got time for that. Perhaps you posted that meme of supermodel Tyra Banks exploding in anger on America's next top model. Or maybe you've simply posted popular gifts, such as the one of NBA great Michael Jordan crying, or of drag queen RuPaul declaring, girl, if you're black and you shared such images online, you get a pass. But if you're white, you may have inadvertently perpetuated one of the most insidious forms of contemporary racism. One of the most insidious. See, here's the thing. When it's not clear racism, we just call it insidious racism. It's hidden, secret racism. It's, that's how it's insidious. It's just poisonous. It's gone under the surface, guys. You, says John Blake, may be wearing digital blackface. So what is digital blackface? Digital blackface is a practice where white people co-opt online expressions of black imagery, slang, catchphrases, or culture to convey comic relief or express emotions. These expressions, what one commentator calls racialized reactions, are mainstays in Twitter feeds, TikTok videos, and Instagram reels, and are among the most popular internet memes. Because as we know, there are no memes of white people online. They just do not exist. Nobody's ever used a meme of a white person, despite the fact that Donald Trump is basically the most popular person online because all he is is a series of memes, at least when it comes to the Twitterverse. There's never been a white person that you make memes about. It's all black people. And if you use a black person in a meme because the facial expression is evocative of an emotion that is inherently funny, for example, not because they're black, but because the emotion evoked is funny, this is because you are a racist because everything is racist. Digital blackface involves white people play acting at being black, says Lauren Michelle Jackson, an author and cultural critic in an essay for Teen Vogue. 
Jackson says the internet thrives on white people laughing at exaggerated displays of blackness, reflecting a tendency to see some, uh, among some, to see black people as walking hyperbole. Well, no, every meme is walking hyperbole. Every single meme is walking hyperbole. That, that is the purpose of a meme. When you have a, an animated dog in a room on fire, that is hyperbole. That's the whole point of the meme. But no, it's racism. It's racism. And it has to be racism because, again, in order to condemn American society, we must have a constant steady supply of the heroin that is racist incidents. Well, this digital blackface thing is nonsense. I'll tell you what else is nonsense. Those free phone deals from Verizon, AT&T, or T-Mobile. That's just another trick to lock you into a long-term contract that'll cost you a fortune every month. Instead, get a brand new iPhone 12 from Pure Talk for just $12 a month. With Pure Talk's $30 plan, there's no contract and no interest. You can cancel or leave at any time. Get a new iPhone 5G service and cut your cell phone bill in half with Pure Talk. I'm a Pure Talk customer. You should be as well. Switch right now in as little as 10 minutes at puretalk.com. Enter promo code Shapiro to save 50% off your very first month of coverage. Choose from a variety of unlimited talk and text plans with plenty of high-speed data, all backed by that 100% money-back guarantee. Pure Talk saves the average family over $900 a year. There's no contract, no hidden fees, no hassle. Go to puretalk.com. Enter promo code Shapiro to save 50% off your very first month of coverage. And get an iPhone 12 for just 12 bucks a month. That's puretalk.com. Promo code Shapiro. Pure Talk is simply smarter wireless. I've been using Pure Talk for all my business calls. The coverage is great. It's very easy to switch over. Do the same thing I did. Head on over to puretalk.com. Enter promo code Shapiro. Save 50% on your first month of coverage. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Well, all this talk of racism, sexism, homophobia, it's not a lot of fun, but I'll tell you something that is fun. That's prize picks. As much as I love watching baseball and rooting for the White Sox, prize picks makes it a lot more fun. Prize picks is the easiest and fastest way to play daily fantasy sports. You pick two to six players and you choose whether they will score more or less than their prize picks projection. You can win up to 25 times your money on any entry. There's no competing against other people. It's just you versus the projections. Prize picks offers projections on pretty much every sport there is. The NBA, NFL, MLB, NHL, PGA, college sports, disc golf, whatever you're into. The app is really sleek. It's easy to use. Entries can be made in less than 60 seconds. Withdrawals are safe and fast. My producers have been using prize picks. They've been raving about it. They made entries on March Madness and the NBA. They say that the simplified interface is excellent. It's much easier to use than the ends of fantasy sports apps. They have pretty much every sport you can think of so far. My producers are up a little bit, so we'll keep you updated on how they do. Download that prize picks app or go to prizepicks.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. First time users can receive 100% instant deposit match up to 100 bucks with promo code Ben. If you deposit 100 bucks, prize picks gives you 100 bucks. Don't forget to enter promo code Ben at up for an instant deposit match all the way up to $100. Some may say posting a video of Sweet Brown saying, oh, Lord Jesus, it's fire. It's just for laughs. You can't even do it. By, by the way, you can't even you can't even say the lines from that particular video without laughing. That video happens to be one of the funniest videos in the history of the Internet. That, that video of, of Kimberly Wilkins talking about escaping a fire. It is one of the great videos in, in the history of the Internet. I mean, they, they made it into like an actual digitized song. It's fantastic. But apparently you're not allowed to say it's funny anymore. Why overthink it? Why give people yet another excuse for labeling white people racist for the most innocuous behaviors? But critics say digital blackface is wrong because it's a modern day repackaging of minstrel shows, a racist form of entertainment popular in the 19th century. Now, they acknowledge that there's no real great way of telling what digital blackface is. And that there, there's, no, there's no actual way of finding out what it is because maybe you're just laughing at a thing because it's funny. Like if I laugh at a Dave Chappelle joke because Dave Chappelle is a funny human, Am I now engaging in digital blackface? I mean, I didn't dress up as Dave Chappelle, but it doesn't matter. Again, this is what happens in a society that's desperate for crisis in order to generate change. We're seeing this, by the way, not just in the United States. You're seeing this pretty much everywhere. And that one, one of my favorite verses in all the Bible, there, there's a, a verse in Deuteronomy. Jeshurun got fat and kicked, right? The, the basic idea, Jeshurun represents the Israelites. The basic idea is that when civilizations get too fat and happy, they look for excuses to rebel against God and to wreck themselves. And you're just seeing it in civilization after civilization. We are such a rich, prosperous, thriving, multiracial society that we don't have to look for excuses to wreck things. You know, we, we live in a society that, that happens to be particularly rich, particularly wealthy, and particularly non-racist. And this is why we have to go looking for instances of racism. In fact, racism is so rare in American society, like true racism, true overt, serious racism, or even systemic racism, where a policy is directed at a racial minority, that stuff is now so rare in American society that we have to make it up. In fact, the, the entire incentive structure in the United States, because the demand for, for racist incidents is so high, is for more people to now masquerade as being members of minority races than the other way around. I pointed this out on the program before. It used to be, when America was truly a much more racist place, that passing was a major 
issue for a lot of black Americans, for example. An entire feminist novels written about black Americans trying to pass as white Americans because to live as a black American in America was very, very difficult. And if you could pass as a white American, you could, you could live a much easier life. Well, today, we now see a lot more publicized instances of the reverse. When is the last time you saw a black person attempting to masquerade as a white person then uncovered that way? But we now have yet another case of a person masquerading as a minority in order to get ahead. According to the New York Post, one of Hollywood's leading Native American figures is being accused of faking her claims of Cherokee heritage. So we have ourselves in Elizabeth Warren of Hollywood. Award-winning Heather Ray, 56, serves on the Academy of Motion Pictures Indigenous Alliance, previously headed up by the Sundance Institute's Native American program, and claims, quote, my mother was Indian and my father was a cowboy. Multiple prior news reports have also cited her as having a Cherokee mother. But a watchdog group called Tribal Alliance Against Frauds is now demanding the Academy and the producer drop her false claims, while activists insist she's at best one 2048th Cherokee, which is like even less Native American than Elizabeth Warren is. The group accuses her of profiting from usurping real American Indian voices and perspectives and being a fraudulent so-called pretendian. Ray is married to another Hollywood producer, Russell Friedenberg, and the eldest of their three children is actress Johnny Sequoia, who currently stars in the reboot of Dexter. Ironically, Ray was already caught up in the highest pretendian scandal to hit Hollywood. The producer was thanked by the Academy last year for brokering an apology to Sasheen Littlefeather. Littlefeather was blacklisted in Hollywood for appearing on Marlon Brando's behalf to decline his 1973 Best Actor Oscar and jeered as she spoke up for Native Americans claiming to be Apache. But after her death in October, Little, Littlefeather's sister revealed she was a liar who had faked her identity all along. So hilariously, we now have an infinite regress of pretendians. So the person who brokered an apology to a fake Native American in Sasheen Littlefeather and herself brokered the apology, this, this woman, Ray, Heather Ray, it turns out that she is a pretendian as well. Again, when you have a society where people are literally going out of their way to pretend to be members of minority races, this would suggest a pretty tolerant and diverse society. And it also suggests a society where there is a deep and abiding interest for a lot of folks in claiming that society itself is radically discriminatory and therefore needs to change. And so when it turns out that it's very difficult to find evidence that this is the case, we just keep stretching out the boundaries of people who are in fact victimized. All right, guys, the rest of the show is continuing right now. You're not going to want to miss it. We'll be getting into a discussion with Ami Horowitz. He has a brand new video actually from Israel talking to Israeli Arabs. You've been told it's an apartheid state. What do Israeli Arabs actually say about that? If you're not a member, become a member. Use code Shapiro at checkout for two months free on all annual plans. Click the link in the description and join us.